on this edition of expose los angeles police officers firing their weapons in the line of duty time and time again says the lapd the shootings are justified two reporters dig through the evidence and find a different story cops guns scrutiny Funding for Expose has been provided by If you're on the freeway with Scott, he has a tendency to tap the pedal back and forth. It, it can make you kind of lotion sick. See, when, when people say that, you know, Matt and I have like a work-wife relationship, Who this is that? the sort of thing where I see that that is, is true. This your fantasy? Because this is exactly something like that my wife would say about like alleged pedal tapping and, you know. I don't know that anyone ever has separated them. I have rarely seen them apart. And there is some kind of chemistry. I don't really know what it is. Reporting duo Matt Late and Scott Glover began working together seven years ago when they joined forces on the Los Angeles Times police beat. I wanted a job that was interesting, that was different every day, uh, where you met new people and, and learned things that other people didn't know. Glover and Late make it their mission to expose what isn't known about abuses of power inside the LAPD. Can you sort of walk us through how you came about it at all? I mean, it's, I don't know. Well, their approach is different from people with kind of a prosecutorial approach who are very aggressive and tough. They have a very low-key, laid-back approach. They get a lot of cooperation because they don't have an axe to grind. They don't have an ideological um, point they want to make. They don't have a worldview that they're trying to validate. We go meet this guy, and he's a lieutenant, and he's very kind of grizzled and, and marine-like and looking over at us like we're two liberal commies. And, and, uh, and what was the quote he said to us? It was like, uh, I can't remember. You got this lying, cheating, mm -hmm. son of a bitch, murdering yeah. son of a bitch in prison, and you're here questioning my credibility? That, that upsets like that. me. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Glover and Late don't just cover the cops. They mirror their techniques. Try to work how they work. Think how they think. This is what detectives call walking the scene, and it's what Glover and Late do when they investigate. On a very basic level, to come out here and very slowly, very methodically, okay, is this the right address? Okay, that had to be the balcony that they were standing on. All right, and so the cops would have been down here. And, and just to get a visual grasp of, you know, th that is very helpful all down the line as you're trying to weigh what one side is saying versus what the other side is saying. Call it forensic journalism. Uh, the reporters have brought us back to the scene of a shooting there. where officers claimed they were in a firefight. We came down here with the shooting reports uh, so we could look at what the cops said occurred. In this case, the ballistics evidence didn't add up. You see where the wood is kind of like, you'll see like little, um, yeah, there. One officer is describing bullets whizzing by his head. Um, Yet, it, despite this firefight that's going on, when the investigators came out, all the impacts, all the bullet casings, all the shells, everything they found were the officers' bullets going that way. They found nothing to indicate the people up on the, the balcony there had fired this way. LAPD officers had told one story about this shooting. The evidence told another. It's not an isolated example. Glover and Late analyzed over 2,000 police shooting reports, spanning nearly 20 years, to open a window into the hidden world of the LAPD. They studied data, dug through evidence, revisited crime scenes, and interviewed cops and witnesses to reveal a troubling pattern of withholding evidence and resisting oversight within one of the nation's most high-profile police forces. And they did it using the LAPD's own data, this is the, um, 
the full officer involved shooting report on this incident a full shooting report could be about this thick but the police commission depends on the department to summarize the relevant and, and crucial facts of a shooting in this little report the five member civilian police commission is appointed by the mayor and serves as a public's watchdog whenever an officer fires a weapon it's the commission's job to decide whether the officer acted properly if a shooting is okayed by the commission it's called in policy but as they looked into police shootings, Glover and Late suspected the commission wasn't getting all the facts. They had seen evidence withheld before, in 1999, when they broke the story of the biggest police corruption case in the history of Los Angeles, the Rampart scandal. A rogue cop in the LAPD's anti-gang unit had been caught stealing a million dollars worth of cocaine from an evidence locker. He testified that dozens of other officers were engaging in criminal activity. Feeding suspects, framing suspects, covering up unjustified shootings. Uh, he said that the gang unit essentially act like a gang. As the scandal unfolded, LAPD officers were confiding in Glover and Late, while the Civilian Police Commission's investigator was kept in the dark. We, we were outsiders. We were not part of the process of the department. Um, and uh, we had been excluded from what was obviously an important and sensitive corruption investigation. This wasn't a case of one story or two stories or even 10 or 20 stories. It was day after day, week after week, month after month. The LAPD disbanded the anti-gang unit, but internal reforms were short-lived. Glover and Late kept on the trail, questioning the LAPD about its conduct in police shootings. As time went on, you know, and, and it faded kind of from the forefront here in L.A. and elsewhere. I think that is where we played more of a role. We kept focused on it. You know, we're coming back to the LAPD two and three years later and saying, well, what about this shooting? What about that shooting? The department it polices its own, and we wanted to test the quality of these investigations. Were they really uh, getting to the bottom of what was going on in these shootings? And, uh, and if they were, were they relaying that information to the police commission, which was the ultimate judge? If the LAPD was failing to give the whole story to the police commission, Glover and Late were determined to give it to LA Times readers. They requested public records dating back to 1985 of every LAPD shooting. Right, They're very uh, fanatical about getting to ground truth uh, on a question uh, or an issue. They're very assiduous about doing a lot of uh, spade work. They immerse themselves so deeply in every aspect of it that it's sort of in their bones and their blood. They worked for four years using public information, okay. officers' names, badge numbers, type of weapon. A Times colleague entered and crunched the numbers, allowing Glover and Late to track patterns in more than 2,000 shooting incidents. If you want to see how many times not hot the LAPD is shot at an unarmed person. Our database shows that it's happened more than 200 times, 225 times here. So I have a particular officer up here, and you can see that there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten instances in which he was present at a shooting, and seven. Uh, in which he pulled the trigger. The duo learned something even the LAPD didn't know, that a tiny number of repeat shooters, fewer than 1%, were responsible for 20% of LAPD uh, shootings. Zero, nine, but it was when they lined up another set of data that they found a stunning contradiction which spurred them to dig deeper. You know, you look at this first one here, $15 million. In either sizable jury awards or out-of-court settlements, the city was paying millions to shooting victims. Yet in many of those same cases, Glover and Late found that the shootings had been ruled in policy by the Civilian Police Commission. Some commissioners were shocked when we came back to them and, you know, we had this list of printouts in policy, you know, $425,000, in policy, $1.7 million, in policy, you know, $800,000, whatever it is. And I, I remember that a couple commissioners were just, they, they had no idea because once they found it in policy, you know, unless they happen to read about it in the newspaper or something, they're not going to know what becomes of it. And I'd look at that and say, how could this be? If everything was right, why are we paying all this money? 
And of course the answer is that in too many cases, it wasn't, everything wasn't right. When everything wasn't right, it was often because the police weren't telling the whole story. We're writing about when people that the public has entrusted with tremendous powers abuse those powers and essentially break the law themselves. This is the Ferguson Robb shooting. It was a case that ultimately resulted in a $1.7 million payout. It involved a couple of officers from the Southeast Division who went by the nicknames Batman and Robin. Uh, the shooting was found in policy. The police commission did not know a lot about this case. One of the interesting things we got was a, was a um, copy of the 911 call. Glover and Late listened to the 911 tape and realized it contained information that called the officer's story into question. And what had happened was, prior to the shooting, the occupants of the house called 911. At the same time the officers were outside the house, the occupants were on the phone with 911. And they said, that there were people outside knocking on their doors and windows. We don't know if they're real police or not. They're here for no reason. Nobody here has done nothing. And we wonder why they're banging on our windows and stuff. And then minutes later, you hear him on the phone saying, they're shooting at us. They're shooting at us. Oh, they shot. They shot. They shot. They shoot. They shoot. They shoot. You hear that? It appears from the tape that the officers are the aggressors in the incident. It's hard to tell. The 911 call was never mentioned in the summary that went to the Civilian Police Commission, proof that the LAPD was withholding information from the city's watchdog. Sometime after we wrote the story, Officer Ferguson uh, was arrested in connection with a home invasion robbery ring involving himself and other police officers. Glover and Late continued gathering evidence for their police shootings investigation and continued publishing stories. They represented sort of the voice of support for strong oversight. And within the department, um, those voices were, were muted. Scott Glover and Matt Late from the LA Times. We're going to pick up some autopsy reports. Thanks. They knew what the law entitled them to get in terms of information, and they got it, and they wrote amazing stories. They would report things uh, that was news to us as well as to the public. Meanwhile, the U.S. Justice Department investigated the LAPD. It concluded there was a pattern of excessive force and mandated reform. The LAPD agreed to monitor problem officers and expand the role of the police commission, including providing commissioners with all the evidence from police shootings. I think it was in response to the, the constant stream of articles identifying major flaws within the police department that really got the attention of the Justice Department in Washington. And the Los Angeles Times in general, and Scott and Matt in particular, played a very important role. Uh, you know, I'm sure that a little, uh, the way that a lot of these cops feel is like, you know, it just makes them sick that we're sitting there scrutinizing what they're out there doing, putting their lives on the line, and like, what do we really know about it? And, you know, uh, on one level, they're right. But we try to know as much as we can about it. We made an effort to experience, even if in some small way, what the officers go through with these shootings. So we went through a couple of different simulators. One at the FBI and another at the LAPD Academy. You know, you have a gun, and at some point, a, uh, a bad guy comes out, and he's got a gun. And I shoot, I don't know how many rounds, too many probably. And the instructor comes out right afterwards. He's like, okay, what do you got? And I said, I, I don't know. You know, the, the bad guy came out, and he pointed a gun at me, and I thought he was going to kill me, so I shot him. Well, how many rounds did you fire? I don't, I don't know. Well, you better be able to know. I mean, you're going to need to say. I mean, you're going to get fried over this, you know. Why, why did you fire each of the shots? You know, not just I shot X number of rounds. Why'd you fire number one? Why'd you fire number two? Why'd you fire number three? I mean, if he ceased being a threat at round number three, how are you going to explain that? And my feeling was, you know, uh, that I wouldn't have to. You know, that if, that if I 
responded to a hostage situation and some bad guy comes out and is pointing a gun at me and I managed to kill him without hurting anybody else that I'd be, you know, a hero. Well, the one thing we took away from that is, is are they training officers to have answers for everything that happens and does that create a situation where, where they're, they're going to make up something because they fear they're going to be in trouble if they don't? I think, yeah, it's like, yeah, it's like right over there, so left, then right. For three years, the reporters had lived the story, shadowing cops, dissecting dozens of cases, and tracking nearly $70 million in payouts to victims. During that time, the LAPD said it was obeying the federal mandate to better police its own. Then the reporters learned of an out-of-court settlement that would challenge the department's claims of reforms. It involved the shooting of Jason Mitchell. Yeah. Jason Mitchell apparently made a, a hasty left turn cutting off traffic that was coming from this way. It began as a routine traffic stop. But as Glover and Late discovered from witness statements and multiple interviews, the incident quickly escalated. The officers ran Mitchell's plates and learned his license had been suspended. I heard the siren from the, from the police car. Woo! So you know they're pulling over somebody. That's when I stood up here and was looking to see what's taking place. And this is why I was able to see just about everything that happened. According to the officers, they told Mitchell they would have to seize his truck on the spot. Then, Mitchell put the truck in gear. One of the officers jumped onto the truck's running wheel. I noticed the vehicle pull forward. And when they pull forward, the officer grab onto the steering. And then veers over to the left, comes up onto the lawn in this area here, I believe, and runs into the corner of that house. He shoots Mr. Mitchell twice and kills him. This key moment when Jason Mitchell is shot is when the officers and witnesses' stories diverge. To sort out the conflicting accounts, the department recreated the shooting. They brought the officers back to the scene and used a stand-in for the victim. Officer Anthony Perez said he feared for his life and shot Mitchell just before the truck crashed into the house. But witnesses said Officer Perez fired after the truck came to a stop. The witnesses I spoke to had said there was a crash, the cop stepped off the running board, drew a weapon with his right hand, aimed, and then fired two shots. After the vehicle ran into the building and hit the post, that's when he stepped back and then pulled the gun from his side. He didn't have the gun out before. The department also took the extra step of hiring an engineering firm to create computer animation illustrating Officer Perez's story. The firm's analysis determined Mitchell's truck was traveling less than 10 miles an hour when it crashed. This is crucial information because it is a factor in whether the officer could s safely step off of the running board and thereby de-escalate the situation. If it's going nine miles an hour and he steps off, he's no longer facing a life-threatening situation. The engineering firm used an actual recording of the shooting, taken from a tape recorder the officer was wearing at the time. Sir, you... Hey! 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 When we went down to the location of the shooting, we saw some people standing outside, and uh, they told us a, uh, a devastating story uh, as to the sequence of events and what had occurred, and, and at the actual time that they saw the officer shoot uh, my son. The firm could not determine from the recording when shots were fired, but the LAPD stood by Officer Perez's account and the Civilian Commission ruled this shooting in policy. But the commission wasn't getting the full story, such as what the Mitchell family discovered when they visited the morgue. We hired our own pathologist who came up with a startling revelation that I think really turned the tide in the case. And it was an injury to uh, one of his fingers. Uh, it was an apparent bullet wound. And what's 
potentially interesting about this is that it, it places his hand between the barrel of the officer's gun and his chin. The pathologist and I got together and analyzed it. And we had a clear profile of someone leaning backwards with his arms upraised, palm side facing his assailant, which is a defensive gesture, clearly. Attorney Carl Douglas told the city that if the case went to trial, he would argue that Mitchell was shot while surrendering. The city paid Mitchell's family $1.25 million to settle the case. It's, it's yeah. a minor stop turns into death, it should not have happened. And the way that he was shot, as far as I'm concerned, he was, she was shooting to kill him. The car is disabled, he's disabled, there's two of you, why use deadly force? Why, let the car, why not let the truck hit, pull him out, handcuff him? It's done. The officer was out of control. And I just think the officer got angry and lost control of himself. Mm -hmm. I really do. He was not a fleeing felon. He had been found not to have any weapons on him. The last time I looked, the penalty for driving a suspended registered car was not death in California. It didn't have to end in this way. I remember his last thing that he had said to me was we're gonna throw a big party he says but you know mom before the party he says we need to take some things and take it down to the shelter and those things stuck with me and that's what i did so i look at it with a bitter with the sweet of his death and then still being blessed with our younger son but it's um it's hard it's never over. Never. It was tragic for his family. It's tragic for the officer that was involved in this incident. But it was the aftermath of these shootings where those mistakes were being covered up and there wasn't an honest appraisal of what was going on. Glover and Late confronted the police department about the finger wound. The Times would report that the LAPD reopened its investigation but stuck to its original findings. The new evidence was never presented to the Civilian Commission. It was presented to readers of the LA Times when in 2004 Glover and Late finally published their culminating series, distilling years of reporting on police shootings and accountability to the public. It appeared in two front page stories running across eight pages. They were able to express this problem in terms that were unforgettably human. They, they showed you human beings who were shot in circumstances that were questionable or even clearly unjustified and who were not able to get justice. It wasn't a dry, analytical, um, abstract. It, it was not an abstraction. They really fleshed it out and, and made it real and made it very human, which is not easy to do. And that's the real public service I see. They really are fulfilling the role of the press in a free society. They are, without judging the intentions of the public institutions they're covering, they're filling in the gaps. There's a postscript to this story. In 2006, Glover and Late made a public records request to update their database, only to discover that the LAPD had secretly implemented a new policy. The department now withholds the identities of officers who fire their weapons. It was the public availability of the officers' names that had allowed the Times to do its investigation. In new shooting reports, all officers' names have been replaced with an alphabetical list. So now, when we get these reports, it's going to be Officer A, Officer B. That will limit our ability and the public's ability to identify officers who repeatedly use deadly force. When you have police officers that have this enormous power, you want there to be accountability. Their job is harder now, but police accountability continues to drive the work of Glover and Late. If you see detectives talking to somebody, that's somebody you want to talk to right as soon as they're done. 
I don't know what we'll be doing a year from now, five years from now, whatever, but certainly we are drawn to this kind of work. I mean, I think we're both motivated by the watchdog role. Presses will be thundering with your libelous stories. <laughs> to some extent, we have developed this little niche, if you want to call it that, you know, just based on, you know, the documents that we've collected and the databases that we've built um, over the years. It, 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 I think it, we're able to do a different kind of reporting on criminal justice in Los Angeles. Expose has been provided by